9 City Councilor. Today is Thursday, April 2nd. Uh, I'd like to remind folks this is a public hearing being broadcast live and recorded for later viewing on Comcast Channel 8, RCN 82, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV. I'd ask folks in the chamber to silence their uh, electronic devices. Uh, we will take public testimony at various points throughout the hearing. There is a sign-in sheet to my left by the door. We ask that you sign in, uh, um, add your name, any affiliation, residence, and please check the box yes if you do wish to testify and no if you don't. Um, we strongly encourage residents, whether here in the chamber or at home, to take a, a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. Uh, you can do this in several ways. Come to a, one of the 34 hearings and give pub, uh, public testimony. Come to the hearing dedicated to public testimony on Tuesday, June 4th, anytime from 2 to, 4, uh, 2 to 6 p.m. We'll be here at least for that time frame, and we'll stay as long as we need to to hear from everyone who would like to speak on the budget. You can send your testimony to the Committee on Ways and Means, City Council, 5th Floor, Boston City Hall, Boston Mass, 02201, or email the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Uh, we are here with um, our friends from Boston Public School Department to discuss uh, operations, uh, transportation, food nutrition, ser nutrition services, and safety services as they pertain to dockets 0622 through 0625. Orders for the FY20 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits and appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, as well as dockets 0626 through 0628, capital budget appropriations including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. I am joined by the Chair of Education, my friend from Dorchester, at-large City Councilor Anissa Sabi George, and to my right, District 7 Council, my friend from Roxbury, uh, Kim Janey. Uh, with that, we will oh, hand it off. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, I'm That's sorry. Yours. And Tim, <laughs> he's already gone in my mind. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, District 5 City Council, my friend from Hyde Park, my very good friend from Hyde Park, Tim mm -hmm. McCarthy. Thank, Thank you. Good uh, <laughs> Sorry, Tim. I love you. How are you doing, Councilor McCarthy? <laughs> it's good to have you here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having us. Uh, as uh, Councilor Sioma mentioned, this is the FY20 budget hearing for operations within Boston Public Schools. My name is John Hill. I'm the Chief Operating Officer. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present uh, to you today. I'm joined by Adela Vern Stanislaus, our Director of Transportation, Laura Benavides, our Executive Director of Food Services, and Kim Peltro, our Executive Director of Safety Services. Before I move on, it's very important for me to mention that food services and especially transportation and safety services are not departments nationwide that are typically known for being run by women. And I'm extremely proud of the fact that not only do we have women here running these departments, but we have absolute rock stars running these departments day in and day out for thousands of children across Boston Public Schools. It gives me great pride uh, to be able to turn the microphone over to them today to present to you on their very, very important departments. Uh, that said, as you know, operations consists of other areas as well. And so what you will not be hearing from today are facilities management, Facilities Planning and Engineering, the Office of Instructional Information Technology, and um, our, our General Operations uh, Department, which consists of operational superintendents, operational leaders. Uh, I think it's important that, although this is a budget hearing and we often talk about numbers on a page at budget hearing, uh, it's important that you also realize that there are more than 2,000 people 
across BPS operations, uh, the vast majority of whom work on the roads or in our schools, uh, very few of which work in central office positions. Uh, and those people are the custodians who show up in five degree weather and a foot of snow to clear our schools uh, for, for children. Uh, they're the food service workers who show up at six in the morning to get breakfast ready. Uh, they're the safety service officers uh, who have the enormous pressure on their shoulders to keep our children safe. They are the bus drivers who take our kids to and from school as if they were their own children. They are the IT workers who quietly work behind the scenes to make sure our technology is running smoothly across the district. They are the tradesmen and women uh, who, when the systems break down, uh, are there, again, behind the scenes making those repairs and fixes for the students the next day. And lastly, they are the operational superintendents, operational leaders, who are the lifeblood of the operations at our schools and the allies to our school leaders. With that, and before I pass it to Delavern to discuss transportation, I think it's important to note that the three departments you'll be hearing from today have all presented to City Council this, uh, this current school year. And in fact, transportation and safety services have led uh, three different presentations to City Council over the last six weeks. Um, so because of that, you may see some content that you've seen in recent weeks. Because of that, you'll see a brief presentation, but we welcome your questions after that. Great. Thank you again very much. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning, councillors. I would like to start off say, by saying it's truly an honor and humbling experience to represent who I perceive to be some of the hardest working employees across the district, the transportation team. I'm also honored to be sitting next to two department heads in operation, Laura and Kim. I would like to start off this morning by sharing some highlights, some transportation highlights. The transportation team continued to innovate in transportation, for example, continuing the work with MIT. We're also working with Virginia Tech to study our road speeds to improve our maps. We've worked extremely hard to improve our on-time performance, which we have done this school year. We've worked collaboratively across departments within BPS, our special ed team and our IT team where later on in our presentation, you'll see in the budget where we've um, accomplished projecting um, some decreases across uh, in the budget for next school year, sorry. The Department of Transportation mission is to provide safe and timely transportation services to students of Boston schools. Our team worked tirelessly day in and day out to accomplish this goal. The, the transportation department oversees a large yellow bus system where we transport 26,000 students to 228 unique locations in and out of the city of Boston daily. We are obligated to transport not only BPS students, but our charter, private parochial, and private placement students. To put that into perspective, to provide transportation to provide transportation to non-BPS students accounts for 21% of our total spending. We do this within the confines of BPS policies that dictate school choice, but also state and federal regulations, all of which increase the complexity of what we do. Through our continued efforts in transportation, we have been able to slow the growth of our spending each and every year. This is a huge accomplishment, which leads us to project spending to be $125.6 million next year, which is essentially flat with our current year's projection. On this slide here, we have a breakdown of our spending, again, we are expecting our overall spending to be flat with movement within different cost categories. We have seen major cost growth in special education related expenses, such as door-to-door -door students and students who require monitors, especially monitor educate, sorry, sorry. Okay. We have seen major cost growth in special education related expenses, such as door-to-door -door students and students who require monitors, especially those requiring one-to-one -one monitors. Increases in the number of students in transition has also been a major cost driver in the last few years. 
In our fiscal year 20 budget, we are taking necessary steps to, cur to curb the cost growth we've seen. We will continue our route optimization work to make sure our system is efficient. Planning on fewer door-to-door -door students and optimize the packages of our bus mo monitors who are servicing our students most in need. We are, also we are also to make an investment in M7 passes for all students in grades seven through 12. You might also notice the slight increase when comparing actuals to budget within our central office personnel. We do not plan to change our current staffing levels. Salaries are budgeted based on average salaries at the district level. We have been faced with some turnover the last few years resulting in vacant positions. We are proud and excited that we will be able to continue to replace our diesel buses with propane powered buses. By next year, 50% of our entire fleet will run on alternate fuel. Not only is this better for the environment, but better for our students with asthma. I would also like to highlight when compared to our peers nationally, nationally over 90% of the 480,000 480, school buses still use diesel. Starting next school year, every student in seventh through 12th grade who lives and attends schools in the city of Boston will receive an M7 pass. This will give them the opportunity to not only explore the city and all its, this will, this will give them the opportunity to explore the city and all it has to offer. This was made possible through a $500,000 investment in collaboration with the mayor's office and the MBTA. I would also like to highlight the transportation department is still in the running for a $1 million Safe Routes to School grant through MassDOT. The transportation team is, is continuously working on a number of initiatives to drive costs down while improving services for parents and families. We've reorganized our monitor unit in order to provide better service for our students with special needs. We are working in close collaboration with other BPS departments as well as our contract on, as well as our contractor TransDev. In addition, communication with families is one of our top priorities. So we have moved to staff our call center to align with when they are calling. I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. Thank you, Delaware. Uh, thank you, Del. Uh, good morning, and thank you, counselors, for the opportunity to provide updates on the Food and Nutrition Services Department. Thank you, John, for the introduction. I'm also proud to be sitting here with the strong women of operations. And I'm also a proud parent of a BPS student who doesn't have a problem on a daily basis to tell me what she thinks of the school meal program. <laughs> And she, and along with the other 55,000 students, are my guide in how we were able to drive the program. In, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. In food and nutrition services, our budget is built by every meal we serve, and every meal is important as it is reimbursed by USDA. Our mission is to provide safe, wholesome, and nutritious meals to help students achieve academic excellence. And this helps our drive our goals to improve our culture by increasing participation, decreasing waste, and maintain fiscal stability. Um, our budget is mainly driven by two major costs for food and labor, which for FY20, it represents 47 and 45 percent of our costs, respectively. Our other expenses include, excuse me, include costs for uh, paper, equipment, maintenance, and repair of equipment. We build the budget to cover all of our costs, and we analyze participation, rates, models of operation, and school type to ensure we are creating efficient operations. We also focus on menu planning and cost-efficient purchasing to ensure we are able to purchase products that meet our standards, but also minimize the impact to our budget. Um, this slide highlights our budget from the last three years for, and our projection for the end of the 18-19 school year. We are projecting a deficit in this year by $2.3 million. 
The majority of the deficit is due to a decline in participation, specifically planned participation in breakfast after the bell programs. We also further analyzed our participation data and also noted that one third of the decline in participation was due to decline in enrollment. As we, become aware, as we became aware our participation was dropping, we moved to, into processes to recover as much of the deficit as possible. Some of the processes included menu changes to include student favorites, inventory controls both at school sites and our distribution center, managing waste in satellite schools and reviewing orders from schools. This resulted in a decrease in food cost expenses by $2.9 million. We currently provide three service models that make up the meals we serve to students, breakfast, lunch, and after school meals that are either suppers or snacks. We are scheduled to serve almost 11 million meals this school year. This data shows that within the last few years we have seen steady declines in participation, but this year we've seen the participation remain even with even slight increases in lunch. However, the increases are still not sufficient enough to cover the cost of our operation. We had projected more. And we continue to focus on student feedback to adjust our menus and operations to meet their needs and expectations. We know there's still more work to be done and continue to use data to improve and ex the experience for students. As we continue to focus on transforming food services and improve the experience for students, I want to make sure we touch on one of the big projects we had with this year, which was the rollout of the My Way Cafe. As of today, we've launched 29 schools, including the four original pilot sites, and the cafes were launched in the East Boston, Mattapan, and Roxbury neighborhoods. Through this process, we've been able to create over 60 new positions in our schools. The menus are able, they change daily and include what we, we what we think is most important is choices for students. The students smell and see food cooking in their schools, and the cafeterias are focused on student engagement and delivery with a smile. And we've been able to create a dining experience for our students. And principals, have, we've seen, continue to use the cafeteria as an extension of the classroom. And our next step is to launch 25 to 30 additional sites in the Dorchester and South Boston area for the 2019-20 uh, school year. Okay, and I pass it over to Kim. Uh, before I, I just want to recognize we've been joined by Councillor Michelle, Michelle Wu. Thank you, Laura. Um, good morning, Councillors. Thanks again for having us. Um, quick shout out to Laura and Dell. Um, it's always a pleasure to be with them and for all of John Hanlon's support through this process. I also wanted to quickly introduce a couple of familiar faces from Safety Services. Um, we have Rick Durrani in the audience, the Director of Fire and Emergency Response, um, Chief Eric Weston of the Boston School Police. And um, Nick Sacramona has joined us from facilities that we work hand in hand. Nick helps us in every facility around cameras and school access. And we greatly appreciate his partnership and the facilities department every day. Um, so um, we presented in March a little bit of a trimmed down version for you and a quick snapshot of the SY1920 budget. Um, so as a reminder, um, and I always like to start to point out and um, reiterate the mission, the mission of the Department of Safety Services is to provide and maintain a safe learning environment for all students, staff, and guests through daily communication, collaboration with school leaders, families, and partners. Um, the department uh, is composed of 75 school officers, 68 of whom are assigned to schools, um, 80 in total, including our leadership team and clerical. So for our SY1920 budget, um, it's relatively flat. Um, that being said, we're committed to continuing to meet the safety needs of the district through strategic deployment of our officers and resources and expanding our already strong internal and external partnerships. Um, and some of our primary partners that allow us to do that are the Boston Police Department School Unit um, and our Behavioral Health Services Department at BPS. Our priorities for next year, um, controlled school access. Um, this is an important theme, has been this year, will continue to be next year. Uh, and we, our strong focus on supporting schools with fully implementing the superintendent circular SAF 12, which was updated approximately a year ago. And this is really empowering schools to prioritize how they allow people in their schools to mitigate incidents across the board. Um, this also gets reiterated in some of our professional development presentations that we do um, in collaboration with the Boston Police Department, including active shooter presentations. Um, in addition, 
We will constantly be working with them to ensure that their safety plans that are mandated to be submitted in August are updated um, and track, monitor, and support them in their mandatory fire drills, safety mode, and internal threat drills throughout the year. The upgrades to buildings continue. You probably heard a little bit about this in the facilities department. This is the um, authorization of $5 million that was authorized by the mayor last year with the primary project of putting um, new locks on all classroom doors across the district. Um, so as we participate in our internal audits um, with schools, we will monitor that project as well and make sure that we're making recommendations along with classroom and school locks. That money is set to prioritize um, the upgrading when necessary of PA systems, uh, buzzers used for front doors, and cameras and monitors to go along with those buzzers. Those are also issues that we look at during the internal aud audits that go along with monitoring the upgrades. Our Boston School Police, uh, we're happy to talk about the fact that we're looking to update and are in the process of updating um, trainings and training and operational manual and pursuing a strategic reassignment and deployment um, plan to enhance our capacity and support proactive school site visits across the district. And what I mean by that is particularly looking at our superior officers and their capacity to be mobile throughout the district. Um, we were able during this school year to bring on a new deputy chief and that position was specifically, dined, specifically designed, pardon me, to be 70% mobile to look at how we're, how we're proactively arriving at schools and offering support throughout those schools. So you're either assigned to a school, you're doing a proactive school site, or you're responding to something. And we're looking forward to tracking that as we move into the next school year. An ongoing communication, this is a daily thing at BPS. Um, contacting school leaders, making sure that they're initiating calls to safety uh, in a timely fashion and including the full operation teams, including operational superintendents and leaders um, is a daily exercise for us and safety services supports that, primarily myself, Chief Weston and, and Director Duraney. Um, in addition to that though, we've heard from several school leaders that BPS doesn't always communicate as efficiently as they would like. They're asked to go to several different places for information. So what we'd like to try to do, and I'm working on this with our OITT, OIIT department, with John's support, is how can we get out our primary, most important highlights and safety messages throughout the year? Uh, as, a, as an example, um, when your safety drills are due. Sending flags to school leaders in their email. So they don't have to go to a school messenger, they don't have to go to a website, they don't have to go to a porthole. These are the five things that Kim and her department really want emphasized this year and they're gonna pop up on my screen. So in my initial conversations with OIT, this doesn't seem that complicated, so we're looking forward to hopefully remedying some of that for school leaders and simplifying their days. Uh, in addition to that communication with school leaders, um, BPS is still using um, this vital um, Crisis Go app for day-to-day -day communication among central office. We have also explored this year and are in the last stages of asking school leaders that participated in a pilot program um, in eight separate buildings to um, complete a survey. So the Crisis Go app that we employ with the district also has a building specific capacity. Um, so they've used it and when we initially looked at Crisis Go as a district, it was most important for school um, staff and leaders to be able to talk to each other within their school through some sort of app. While we encourage layers of communication, we also wanna be using the app that we're paying for every year to the best of its ability. Um, the feedback from school leaders thus far has been good and we hope to expand that in the next school year. So our strategic partnerships. Um, Sandy Hook Promise, I'm gonna highlight the Say Something Anonymous reporting system. Um, so we have um, worked with BPD intensively um, as well as EMS to ensure that um, we can move forward with this launch in the next school year. Um, this is a um, pretty intensive training uh, reporting app in the sense that we have several different parties to train. So the Say Something Anonymous reporting system, I'll remind folks, is a website, it's a smartphone app, and it's a phone number. Um, it's part of the Knowing the Signs program through our partnership with Sandy Hook Promise. Um, we are um, hosting eight pilot schools next year. Um, and while we completed some of that training this school year, we will move to um, schedule the dispatch and EMS first responders through BPD over the next three months along with scheduling school communities 
and the students and staff of those school communities when those trainings are complete, um, which, will be, which are slated to be early fall, then we'll be able to launch the app. Um, so we have to be very deliberate, and Sandy Hook Promise has been a very big support in this in making sure that all parties are trained properly on board, because as soon as we train the young people and the staff, that app will go live, which will allow us to receive those anonymous tips and act on them. And so we're looking forward to creating that additional pathway for students and staff to be able to voice concerns in a prevent with a preventative intervention focus. Um, Boston Center for Youth and Families. Uh, this is an exciting partnership. I've worked with them for years in my career in Boston. Um, we set up a model last school year, um, and essentially based on proactive relationships building with students and staff and, and focused on prevention and intervention in specific schools. So we align with the school unit of BCYF. We, I go with those managers to meet with um, the school leaders and their designated safety staff or support services staff, usually a combination thereof in their school. We sit down and say, this is what BCYF has to offer. What is fitting for your jurisdiction in your school? For instance, do you need more support in building rapport with students during transition in your building? Do you need more support during lunch periods? Do you need support in transition as your young people are moving from JFK to the high school? Um, inherent in that model is a proactive nature of what it should be. Um, so we want BCYF partners, along with school staff, not only creating rapport with staff, but most importantly, creating rapport and thus creating more opportunities and pathways for young people around resources that BCYF may have to offer and potentially mitigating violence in schools and in the community at the same time. Um, so this has been an ongoing partnership. As we approach spring, we reinvigorate those relationships. We and continue our visits, and I've expanded it to some of our middle schools to be proactive in that age group, giving some of the issues that we've seen, particularly over the last year. Boston Police Department, uh, Commander Sergeant Detective Thomas Sexton, who was at our last hearing, um, and his officers, I can't say enough about them. We work with them on a frequent basis, a daily basis. Um, they are housed at BLA along with Chief Weston and his officers, Dispatch and Behavioral Health. Um, they are, are now falling under the um, Office of Community Engagement under Nora Baston. Um, so that's an exciting change. Um, but they have been a critical partnership and, a clear, and will continue to be, um, particularly in the climate that we see with so many people, so many young people on the spectrum of threats that we have to deal with on a daily basis. They are amazing in jumping on those incidents, being supportive, helping us get the services to young people that they need, and making sure that our school communities are safe in partnership with Boston School Police and the staff there. Uh, Succeed Boston in the, in, the, in the Boston Fire Department. So this is a program um, it was originally set up by Rick DeRainey, and um, we share it with social emotional learning and wellness through Succeed Boston. There's been some slight changes this year in the court system, so there's not as much leverage to encourage young people to get the education that are ages to seven to 12 because they can't be mandated to go to court anymore. But in a nutshell, this is an education awareness program. So if young people across the city display um, fire setting behaviors, they're referred to this uh, program that occurs on a Saturday, and if they, in, if they are of a certain age, um, over 12, then they're deferred from the court system, which is the goal, right? This is a partnership between Jody Elgy at Succeed Boston and her staff, educators and clinicians, and the Boston Fire Department, um, and the parents and the family. Um, so it's been very successful in the past. We served 42 young people last school year. We've served 19 this school year. Um, and um, what we're looking forward to do is working with our operational superintendents around how we can still offer this educational opportunity within the code of conduct for that seven to 12 year old and maybe take the education to them. Maybe look at doing it school-based um, because really it's just important to support the young people and make sure that those behaviors don't continue. And then last but not least, certainly, um, our constant support from the behavioral health team. We have partnered with them through money that was originally um, brought to the district by um, Makiba McCreary, who sent, moved on, and um, her team in external affairs uh, from Eastern Bank. But it allowed us to partner with My Life, My Choice again and expand some of the services. So last year, we were able to um, provide direct training for all 125 schools on education awareness around commercial exploitation, commercial sexual exploitation of children. This year, we have had one full session again 
as well as train six to eight school psychologists in being able to co-facilitate with a My Life, My Choice facilitator. And if you know anything about that organization, they're largely staffed by survivors of that life. Um, so Andrea Amador staff, six to eight of them will be tra had been trained, have been trained, pardon me, in March, and will be able to co-facilitate the first cycle either this year or beginning in September. And that will allow, for instance, a middle school principal decide that I want to offer this education awareness to my entire seventh grade. A consent form would go out to the parents of the entire seventh grade. If those young ladies want to sign up, they can. And that's what the that's what that education awareness group is about. It's not about I think this young lady is involved in trafficking, therefore I'm going to refer her. That could happen at any point along the, spec, the continuum of offering services to young people, but this is really about education, educating our young women that are exposed, to, young ladies that are exposed to this type of issue. So that's all for safety services. I'll open it up for questions now or hand it back to John. Thank you. Well, Seth, welcome. Thank, any questions? Thank you again. Thanks, John. And we've been joined by Councillor Frank Baker as well. Chair recognizes Councillor Nisasabi Joy. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all. I'm going to just start with safety school services um, since that's where we finished. Kim, just thank you very much for um, all of your work, uh, especially preparing for and participating in our hearing in March. And just a lot of my focus has been around school safety, so I just want to thank you and your department's um, effort. Uh, in partnership and all this. And I also want to say that as I continue to visit schools, I've noticed a real difference in the um, entry, sort of how I'm welcomed into the school, that process. It's not any less welcoming, but it, it feels much more secure. I feel much better when I visit our schools across the district. Um, and I always feel secure. And I feel more secure in my own kids' schools. Um, so that's just really great. Can you talk a little bit about where we are in the building upgrades, where we are in that process with some of that capital investment from last year? Sure. I might actually ask John to talk about some of the numbers because the contract is in process. Great. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I can speak to that, Councillor. So uh, as has been mentioned here before, um, as of about midway through last year, the 1819, I'm sorry, the 1718 school year, we had a, a capital program um, expenditure of $2.5 million planned for safety in our schools, sa safety upgrades in our schools. Uh, the mayor generously doubled that to $5 million uh, in the years going forward. Um, as we've talked about before, we have begun a lot of that important work with a main priority on classroom door locks. Um, we started that program itself in February, hitting about four to five schools a month. We expect that that initiative itself will wrap up over the next two years, so it'll cover three school years uh, in order to get to all of our schools. As has been mentioned before, many of our schools are already in good working order with their classroom doors, but this is assuring us that everything is uniformly done across the school district with these upgrades that are so important. And then um, what about exterior doors? I know there was a movement to the FOBs so that adults aren't propping open doors to run out for a few minutes. So most of our buildings now on FOBs, I've noticed a big change in a lot of our school outside doors. Yes, all of our schools are now equipped with the card access readers uh, at key exterior door uh, points. Um, in fact, all of our schools have multiple entries with the card readers. Nick Sacramento, who's here today, led that work. It took a few years to be able to do that across the district, but I think people are very, very happy with that. And we've seen a marked decline in the number of doors that are left propped open now for staff who are out at recess or things of that nature. Uh, exterior doors continue to be our number one priority beyond classroom doors. We're happy to say that we don't have any issues per se, but if something were to come up, if we heard from a school today that said that their exterior door is not functioning, we would have a crew out there within hours to repair that. Great. That's, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for that. And then on the, um, the communication piece, Crisis Go in particular, I just I think it's great, the streamlining of communication both as a district within the school community and then the, the ability to communicate out with families and with community should there be an incident. Um, could we use this, most recently in the news there's been um, some stories about measles outbreaks across the, um, across the country. It, could Crisis Go be used in a situation like that to inform a school community either district, the school community internally, or families about some sort of outbreak, whether it's measles, whether it's mumps, which we've seen recently. 
Well, I mean, just to clarify, the full school community doesn't access Crisis Go. Um, the building specific would be staff, and then we use it as in central office in different departments to make sure that we're using our resources efficiently. I would love to see it be able to go out to families should there be an incident instead of a reverse like a robo call out to families or an email out to families. I've received emails if there's been a situation at a school, one of my kids' schools, but mm -hmm. some sort of texting message yep. that says there was this incident, everybody's fine, we'll update you, and I think we've talked about that. Now yeah, right I think here. we can certainly continue to have that conversation with OIIT um, because we have layers of communication that get used now, but that's a very good point. Crisis Co has other elements that we're looking into as well. Right, that, that I think would be great. And how much, what is our investment in Crisis Go since this is a budget hearing? We know what we're spending on that. I have to check again. That, I'll be, check for it you. It would be good to know what we're spending and, and for me to just emphasize and reemphasize your desire to make sure we're getting the most out of it mm -hmm. if we have those resources. Um, yeah, we so can look that up for you, Councillor. We know that there's some good bang for the buck with that Great, investment. Great, thank you. And could we use that for sort of that health issue if we're, because it, an outbreak of some sort would sure. Be considered a crisis. Sure, we could. We could. I mean, we talked about the other day. You know, there's other avenues that we could use to alert someone if you were um, for a transportation incident, for instance. So there's a way that we could. If you've got every school leader on it, it's, it's certainly within the breadth of the app to do that. Right. And then um, my last question around our school police officers: Is there an ability? Um, or some opportunity to teach them some mental health first aid, because we have our health, uh, behavioral health specialists that work in our schools. We've got Andrea Amador's team. We've got our school nurses, and hopefully eventually full-time nurses in all of our school buildings. But yeah. many of our school police officers are actively engaging with our kids. Yeah. Can we give them some mental health first aid or some sort of training to support their ability to better interact with our kids? Of course. So very timely. I'll call my inner Andrea Amador today that I asked her about. But um, we, I just had a conversation with um, Jenna Savage at BPD, and they have some funding that looks like it will cover mental health first aid training in the week in June that we needed for over 60 officers at Boston School Police. Oh, that's excellent. So, that wasn't a planted question. Yeah, I, that. I was wondering. That was nice. Um, but I, I will also say that um, Chief Weston and Deputy Chief Johnson, we've been working very closely together are on the annual professional development schedule for Boston School Police, which includes enhanced internal partners and external partners. But this is a really key. This is something that our Boston School Police officers bring to us. Right. And I know Jenna and um, the best team would love to have some sort of direct affiliation with the Boston Police School Department unit mm -hmm. when they're responding to um, incidents at our school and challenges with our kids. Yeah, we're, lo we're looking to a grant now to partner um, so that we can, um, it's a SAMHSA grant that we're partnering with BPD, and that would provide um, an additional best um, social worker for um, the BPD school unit. Um, we'd have a control part of the city and a focus part of the city. Um, and we'd look at what the impacts on those, those schools are for those intensive services. They would go for with the BPD school unit. Um, and we'd have a liaison at, at BPS that would work with Amy, Andrea Amador to track that work. So we're looking into that expansion whenever, wherever we can find the money. Thank you. Thank yep. you, Chair. Thank you. Councilor Jane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And many thanks to the panel. I want to uh, keep... Um, our focus on school safety just for a little bit. So Orchard Gardens is in my district. There's been a lot of um, a lot of people reaching out to my office around the new box that is there out at the parking lot. There's a new box to collect needles. Can you tell me about what that process was in getting that box? What I'm hearing is concern that it's there, that it will attract more people with more needles. Um, so if you could just uh, help me understand what that process was and, and deciding that that box would be at that school. Sure. Do you want to start? Sure. Okay. Um, so yes, I can speak to that. The, um, uh, there's absolutely nothing cavalier in my response. Uh, I'll try to say that ahead of time. Uh, I believe that this is an example where you have two different groups within the same school community pushing for opposite things. Mm -hmm. um, when we were addressing the very important needs uh, for the safety of the children and staff at that school uh, over the last several months. Uh, we had heard from many people as part of that community that yes, 
uh, needle kiosk would be welcomed there as a way to make sure that needles don't end up on the ground but end up in a safe place. Uh, and so we installed that, that kiosk. Uh, we also are making a commitment that if we find that that kiosk does not seem to be working, uh, we're going to be tracking the number of needles collected on a regular basis. Uh, and if we find that, that that kiosk is actually not working, that it's not a depository where, where uh, people are actually using it to, to put needles in, uh, then we will remove it and work with the community to find either an alternate location or we'll remove it entirely. But uh, we do believe that this is an example where for very, very good reasons, uh, people might be coming at this from two different perspectives. No, and um, I appreciate that. And I should have uh, mentioned, I've also heard uh, from parents in that, that school community that did want the box there. So I think there, there are, um, I think there are people who definitely, they don't want children to be pricked. And they're deeply concerned that there are needles on the school grounds. Um, but may have different approaches on how to tackle this issue. I think it's very important, though, to, to closely monitor. Yes. How often uh, will the box be checked to see how many needles and whether or not we are seeing a decrease in the number of needles on the school grounds as compared to actually in the box? How frequently will the box be checked? Is it I, monthly, I believe that's weekly? weekly. What's I believe that? I said I believe that's weekly. Weekly? Yeah, I can confirm that before the end of this hearing, but I believe that is going to be happening no, weekly. No, I think that would be important. And it, there'll, there'll also be a comparison where someone will also uh, compare that number of what's in the box to the number that may still be on the grounds. Correct. And as, as we've discussed before, our custodial team, um, and not just our custodians who work at Orchard Gardens, but our, our citywide custodial grounds crew uh, are, are tracking the number that they're picking up on a weekly basis as well, uh, daily and weekly. Um, and so, we, yes, we will be able to compare what we find in the kiosk compared to what we find in the ground. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, parents at Orchard also asked for was a higher fence. Mm -hmm. So I noticed this week the black uh, wrought iron fence uh, was taken away, and now there's a, a taller chain link fence. Um, is that a permanent fence, that chain link, or is it is it going to be another wrought iron fence? Because the chain link is, you know, very weak, and people will cut through it. Correct. I'm actually very happy that you asked that question because I wanted to say this publicly today at the hearing. The, the, the way that that work is performed is they remove the old fence. They immediately put up a temporary fence, which is the chain link that you're seeing. Yes. Uh, and they're doing that so that they, they can then prepare the ground and the sort of dimensions for the fence that they need to put in. So that will be replaced by a much taller wrought iron fence. Uh, if you're familiar, I know that you are, with the Melnia Cass Corridor, just a block further down, there's a funeral home on the right-hand side, the same side as the school, where we're essentially looking to mimic the look and feel of that fence, which also gives a very safe perimeter to that property. That's very helpful. Um, and, and thank you for uh, clarifying around the box as well. I think moving forward, it'll be uh, really important to monitor it closely uh, and to stay in close communication with the school community. Um, if I shift a little bit to um, transportation, I continue to be struck by the, the growing costs. Um, on slide three, we're talking about 116 schools that draw from 10 different zip codes. Are those all elementary schools, or do they also include some of the, the schools that we have to uh, get yellow buses for middle and high school grades uh, because they're too far from public transit? Or is that just, is it all elementary? That's all students. All, all students. Yeah. So not just So the 116 kids. schools that draw from 10 different zip codes, those 116 schools are all elementary schools. That's my question. No. no. Go ahead, Sorry. Delbert, sorry. Sorry. No, they're not all elementary mm -hmm. schools. They're yeah, elementary. That would include the, yeah. the high school. Yes, okay. correct. Yes. Um, and it's more than double for door-to-door -door service than it is for corner service, I've, yes. I've seen here. Correct. And it's, Almost three times as much. And it's because you're, you're transporting a smaller number of students uh, and need more staff. It's two different things. And, yeah. uh, Del, if I miss something, um, please jump in. Um, it's, it's two different things. Number one, the, the routes uh, by definition of door-to-door -door address pick up and drop off are less efficient than they would be otherwise. Uh, as a result of that, you're typically not able to put in as many students into buses because the trip takes a little longer because it's a little bit less efficient. Uh, in relation to that, and, and quite frankly for, for 
roughly the same reasons, um, because you're now not necessarily just picking up on main roads at main street corners and rerouting down narrow streets, sometimes one-way streets, other areas. I drove by a wheelchair bus today that has to pull into an apartment complex to pick up a student and then come out of the parking lot. It just makes the routes that much more inefficient, uh, which then drives up the cost. Okay. Um, I have more questions, but I'll save them for the second round. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Did you want to add anything? I'm not Thank I'm you. Fine. Thank you very much. Councilor Wu. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I'll try to go segment, um, section by section until I run out of time, starting with um, Dr. Benavides. Thank you, Laura, for all of your partnership and so, so excited still about the um, good food purchasing program. Any update on, you know, how you're thinking about the rollout of that and um, the establishment of the community advisory committee or um, kind of this first phase of collecting information from vendors? We, we are currently looking at and reviewing the, the, uh, the proclamation and making sure that we're trying to meet all its needs. And uh, we're currently just at the beginning stages and trying to look, it's, right now it's more of an internal conversation mm -hmm. to decide who do we want to invite to the table and then determine that. Because as we are reviewing what the, the, the city's requiring of us, it's also looking at um, working in conjunction with as we're releasing our bids and our RFPs and mm -hmm. our processes for the for and then making sure we have the the proper language that we want to be able to to utilize in the in when we release our documentation. The other thing is that we're also working in conjunction with the Kendall Foundation, which is a, a, a big grant that we did receive for about four hundred thousand dollars. That does a, a third of that focuses on uh, procurement processes. So that's we're, so we're utilizing that assistance to be able to help us uh, use the information from the from the good food purchasing plan. Got it. Just one thing, one thing Councillor, just to add to that, thank you, Laura, mm -hmm. is um, I think it's, it's fantastic that the Food Nutrition Services Department is reaching out to other funders to be able to help with some of the costs associated with this, but I do think it's important to know that even though this is just the very, very beginning stages of the good food purchasing program, that will likely drive up costs, uh, and that is a concern of ours as we sort of look to the future with that. And so what does that mean for this conversation today in terms of are you, is it baked into kind of planning for um, the budget for this next fiscal year or are you just looking at will it not necessarily be reflected until more planning happens? So um, we looked at it from right now we built our budget to be using some of the process that we currently do with some shifts in uh, as how we're transforming more uh, into cafeterias and ca my way cafes mm -hmm. and less of satellite meal programs. So that cost is is is, is reflective in this pro in in this budget. But we also have to take into consideration as we are reviewing and having conversations, we'd have to be able to adjust the budget once we start re you know having those conversations and see what that impacts. Because the the uh, I think the beauty behind the the good food purchasing plan is it does give us time to be able to determine what our next steps would be and to hopefully be able to plan better for what uh, the process that we want to utilize for our, our, our purchasing. Got it. Do you have a timeline for when the Community Advisory Committee might uh, be up and running? Or when Pro you'll start to think about people for that? We are looking at it now, and I'm hoping to uh, probably have some invitations out probably in the, in the summer. Okay. That's our, one of our goals for it, uh, okay. starting in July. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, and then just a quick question about school police, because I, I've been stopping by some of the high schools and um, did what was at Boston Latin Academy um, and just hearing about the way that the space is divided up with school police and the Boston Police School Division um, in the building. Has it always been that way? Uh, I mean, have they always been located in that school building, kind of taking up the, the rooms there? Um, I'm gonna just check in with Chief Wesson, if I can, about the timeline on that. Chief, I know you have quite a tenure at Boston School Police. That would be great. Thanks, Chief. If memory serves me correctly, our office, the safety office, has been at Latin Academy since they basically moved there in so 1991. Uh, we had been at different locations before that, Madison Park, we had been out at the Jenny Barron building. We had done another, we had done an earlier stint at BLA on the front part of the building. And then we've been here now for a long, long time. Uh, the Boston Police School Unit has basically been housed with us since 
probably around 2000, 1999, 2000, and their numbers have increased over the years. Their unit started as, as a commander in 10, then it went up to about a commander in 20, now it's around a commander in 15 or so. Okay. So we just have that little, that corner of the building down on the Deckard Street side. Got it, and is it necessary to be in a, is it just because it's a central location and there there is, it's kind of been that way, or I, I just, thinking about school, you know, many, many classroom needs and um, the school, you know, not that this particular school is complaining or anything, but just how we're hearing about a shortage of space uh, for teachers and for programming. Um, has there been any conversation recently about whether that's the, uh, the kind of plan for the foreseeable future is to use that space in the school building? No conversation as far as the safety office goes. We're, we've just been there. We, yeah. we haven't heard anything from the bowling yep. building or any administration about movement or, or, or anything like that. Yeah, there hasn't been any conversation specific to that. It, if it becomes a, a critical need there, um, you know, where the Latin Academy is expanding in, in enrollment or something along those lines, then I think we'd have to look long and hard at that. There mm -hmm. are other central office staff uh, that are located at Boston Latin Academy. Again, we could, we could look at that in conjunction with the headmaster at Latin Academy. And that's where there, there are, sorry, sorry, Councillor, um, Mr. Chairman, I know I'm out of time. Um, that is where most of the, uh, your team is centralized or is, uh, how many different sites and across, nope. this, uh, across different school buildings? As far as school police are assigned, uh, we have a captain and a sergeant in our dispatch office during the day we have one lieutenant that is housed with the Boston Police School Unit in their offices just down the hall. Myself and my deputy chief and my principal clerk are all housed there along with the school unit offices. And I think go going back to why we were put in that section of the building in, back in 1991, A, it is a centrally located place, and I think it was also a, a, a caveat for the parents of BLA back then because of where they were moving to that building that was hey, you know, you're gonna have a school police officer upstairs, but you also have the department itself downstairs. It was almost like you have extra help here in case something goes on. And we've just been there ever since. And hey, Councillor, I, I would just add to Eric and, and say that um, out of the um, 75 school police officers, 68 are assigned school-based. Mm -hmm. They just, they may stop at BLA for administrative purposes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, and we've been joined by Councillor Ed Flynn, Chair recognizes Councillor Frank Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, everybody. Kim, can, I, I'm sorry I came in late. You were talking about my life, my cho choice, and I am familiar with them. Can you talk a little bit about what the program is there again? Sure, so um, My Life, My Choice has been around Boston for several years, um, <coughs> serving um, young women who um, are exposed to commercial sexual exploitation, mm -hmm. uh, human trafficking, um, largely staffed by survivors. Um, they're over at the Family Resource Center um, in Brighton, um, housed with um, Children's Advocacy Center of Suffolk County, um, and the Crimes Against Children's Unit over there from BBD. Um, so last year, um, we saw a need and were able to collectively at BPS um, get some funding, some private funding, um, to partner with My Life, My Choice and provide um, for all 125 schools an education and awareness, three education and awareness sessions run by My Life, My Choice to educate at least one person from each school at BPS, elementary, middle, and high school. To be able to identify. Yeah, to identify, potential, to be able risk. to know where to get resources. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a great resource to have out there. In addition, as a continuation of that um, second round of funding from Eastern Bank that was secured by our then and Department of External Affairs. Um, it continued this year with one more session, um, which was open to the district again, but focused on school psychologists um, and our health and wellness teams, um, because they sometimes are the ones that'll have the first contact with kids at schools, or they'll see school, you know, yeah. the nurses will see young people in the nurse's office, et cetera, and, and, and they'll start discussing other issues. Um, so, but so let me in, ask you, so how many schools have signed up for the program out of the 125 that were, were offered? 
So I think we had about 85% um, participation rate as far as attending the session. Mm -hmm. What the additional piece um, this year was in March, Andrea Amador, who's the Senior Director of Behavioral Health, um, offered six to eight school psychologists be trained um, through additional money so that they could co-facilitate intensive groups for young ladies in designated schools um, that wanted the service at BPS. And so um, I'll touch on this again. They, um, it would look like this. if they, a school, say a middle school wanted the education and awareness intensive group for their seventh grade, they would send out a consent form to all parents and guardians of the seventh grade, and if they wanted to sign up their young person for that, then that young lady could attend that group. It's not about whether you think someone is participating, there's obviously services and other protocol we could follow if that was an issue, yeah. but it's general awareness for what our um, young females are experiencing in the community at times. Um, so this would be, if they bring in the consent form, then they could join that group. And it's normally a 10-week session, so we're looking forward to running those in co-facilitation with a counselor from My Life, My Choice. Um, we'd hope to do it this year, but you know, this time's getting a little bit short. So we'll be excited because we have everybody trained to start next year. Excellent, yeah. good, that sounds like a good program. Um, do do any of the like when we're talking security? Do do you have camera plans at any any of your schools? Do we do we like at um, Orchard Orchard Gardens? Do we have cameras there? Not just Orchard Gardens, but do yep. we do that at all in in the in the school system? So in general, we respond during internal audits. We take a look at the perimeter um, to some school some schools that there's cameras inside, mm -hmm. um, and we'll speak to the school leaders and safety teams about what their needs are. If we have you know, heightened incidents in certain areas, um, we'll work with Nick Sacramona and our facilities team to do walkthroughs of those schools um, and designate where it's most efficient and we have resources to put cameras up. For instance, the, the most critical point for some schools is just to make sure the front door is visible. Yep. But clearly, given geographic locations and other issues that may be going on in the community, it's helpful to have additional cameras. So we're assessing that on a school-by-school -school basis continually. So we don't have a, a, a camera network that's connected back to the police or, or to the um, the we do. School, you do. Oh, we that do. all goes back to th yep, that goes, shared with the schools and, and the correct. school police. Correct. If you have them, you're able to view them. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Um, John, this is probably for you. We had the, the lead scare a couple years ago. Is there any update on that? Yeah, in fact, um, we've got some very positive updates on uh, lead in the water. Um, first, the, there was lead in the drinking fountains for sure. about two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was. Yeah, it was three years ago. It was around this time, three years ago, um, when uh, things in Flint, Michigan hit a fever pitch um, and other districts sort of came at the tail end of that, uh, including Boston Public Schools. Um, I think it's extremely important to note, and we're constantly trying to remind the general public of this, to the extent that it matters, that uh, yes, there was a problem with several BPS schools at that time. Uh, the problem that we were facing is at the federal action level, and meaning the acceptable level for lead in drinking water was 15 parts per billion. Uh, it was actually 20 parts per billion. We were more stringent here in Massachusetts at 15 parts per billion, and we found some schools that had 18, 21, 28, 16, things of that nature. Flint, Michigan was in the hundreds, mm -hmm. right? So they just think it's important to, to note to people that the problem that we had three years ago, number one, it's old news at this point, but number two, uh, it was nowhere near the level of uh, public health scare that you had in other cities. That said, uh, there has been tremendous positive development in that area over the last three years. There have been a number of schools that were turned off at that point, meaning we shut down their water fountains and put in bottled water. Um, many Many, uh, if not most of those schools, have actually had their fountains turned back on now. Um, we're at the point with the state of Massachusetts where we're actually leading policy for the state. Uh, when we were confronting this crisis two plus years ago and thought, you know, it would be really cost effective and smart and healthy to start filtering our water fountains, particularly those where we've had problems in the past, the state said, you know, we don't know. This is sort of new territory for us, but they were willing to let us try that. We had fantastic results, negligible levels of lead in schools that had water filters attached. And so do you, do you filter at the point of the, of the fountain or the at fountain. the source of, of coming in or the fountain? And uh, as a result of that, the state is now looking to us 
to help lead policy for the state. The uh, Environmental Protection Agency just recently, uh, through the Trump administration, changed the action level, uh, where now there's no longer a, a, a safe threshold, so to speak. Uh, they are just requiring that states there's and no districts. There's no longer a safe threshold, so yeah, they're no longer any amount of lead 15, is okay? They're no longer saying 20, they're saying, they're saying zero, right? Um, oh, okay, but the, okay. the policy is um, very vague and it left states up to their own discretion to actually interpret that as, as they would. Uh, the state of Massachusetts looked to us in BPS, literally, uh, to, to shape some of that policy. We suggested to the state that districts show constant effort and momentum to, to get toward that zero goal uh, across their schools. And the state is now adopting our preferred policy on that uh, as a way of showing the rest of the Commonwealth, here's what Boston is doing, and here's how they're taking a lead in this issue. The last thing I will say is, again, further proof of our efforts in this area. Uh, just last year, the state of Massachusetts uh, awarded only two school districts uh, with a major award related to safe, high quality drinking water for schools. Boston was one of those two school districts. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we've been joined by District 6 City Council Matt O'Malley. Chair recognizes Councilor Ed Flynn. Thank you, Council CMO, and thank you to the panelists for, for, for being here and for your leadership on, on these important issues. Um, I know I just want to follow up on my colleague, Councilor Baker, on um, some safety related issues. I had the opportunity to visit the Family Justice Center at Commonwealth Avenue that, that you referenced. And this morning I was at the Asian Task Force on Domestic Violence for a meeting. Um, but what is, what is the, uh, in a, a couple weeks ago I was at uh, the South End Community Health Center and they were, they want to do more outreach with BPS on reaching young boys in the Boston Public Schools on domestic violence education awareness. Is there any um, updates or status that you have on, on that issue, how we're reaching our young, young boys in Boston Public Schools on um, domestic violence awareness, education, and trauma that they may have experienced in, the, in their own life, lives as well? Good. Councilor, I don't have any specific information on it, but there's two things I think I'm, I'm happy to make that connection with them, um, it would likely fall within the social emotional wellness. Um, and they um, certainly have some sort of curriculum around that work, where it is and how active it is at this time. I'm not certain, but I, we can certainly find out and I can redirect to Jill Carter and, and get you an answer on that and make sure that that link happens. Thank you. And, um, and John, just wanted to follow up also on public health related issues in the, in the schools. I, I always think the most important part of learning is, is during the summertime, or it should be. Unfortunately, a lot of our parents are away and our stu students are away, but in terms of public health, what is the uh, BPS doing in the summertime, reaching vulnerable populations? Maybe they're in public housing, or maybe um, we have a lot of students in poverty, but what what are we doing in July and August to make sure that that lifelong learning continues, but also that there's public health services as well? Mm. Um, I can't speak too much to the public health side of it since that's not um, under operations, but I, I think I can try to be helpful. Um, there are obviously a number of different summer programs uh, within Boston Public Schools where we continue to have touch points with our children. There's an extended school year program uh, for special education. The Office of English Language Learners has a summer program that extends uh, through July and I believe into the beginning of August. Uh, we obviously have summer school up and running for, for children who need those services as well. Um, and lastly, we work very, very closely with the Centers for Youth and Family. Uh, as well as organizations like the Private Industry Council and others to place students in, at the high school age into summer jobs. Um, I'll end there, but I do want to turn it over to Laura to talk about the Summer Meals Program, which, which speaks a little bit to the public health side of things mm -hmm. and is a fantastic service that we provide to families. So um, every year we do offer summer programs available for our families. Last year we had 121 sites are available. This year we have 126. This year we've also collaborated with Project Bread and the city's uh, Boston Eats program as well as the YMCA 
to be able to try to work together to make sure that we're able to capture as many families as possible, or any children, uh, families with children between the ages of one and 19 to be able to participate. One of the other things that we were able to accomplish this year as well, with this, with this collaboration, we got a mobile van to be able to move to different locations to be able to capture students that can't get to some locations that we have. We always welcome any more, any ideas, any place that's willing to be able to have us to be able to provide meals to students. We go everywhere, libraries, parks, pools, anything. So, we, any, and if there's any question of where the locations be, we will make sure to let you know all that information so you can share with your. With yeah, your th that would be that'd be helpful. Thank you for for that great program. Myself and, and Councilor Baker, we represent um, in South Boston the Perkins School, which is located in um, Old Colony public housing development. I also represent um, the Blackstone that's located uh, between Villa Victoria and Cathedral. Um, so I'm always concerned about our students that live right at, right in the public housing developments, the Condon School. But what are we doing this summer for our students on nutritional programs? Um, or what can we do further for our students that live, live in the public housing? Can we? Can we target some of those students to make sure that they're, they have the services that they need, just so that when they go back to school at the end of August, they're healthy, they're, they're happy, and they, you know, they're, they're getting the services that they need to be successful for the upcoming school year? That's a great point. I will go back and t uh, talk with the teams that we're working with, Project again, Project Bread, mm -hmm. and, this, and the Office of Food Access, that we can f see what we can do to target those particular na neighborhoods, and see the, the, the Perkins and then the Blackstone. And, and, and the Condon, too. And the Condon, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, um, it, doing as much as we can for our students that live in the public housing is, is important. Um, and I do appreciate the great work that you guys are doing on, on, this, on these critical issues. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, we've been joined by Councilor Lydia Edwards, who has the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to first, again, congratulate uh, the, uh, the schools for your, uh, Laura, for your program, or the program My Way Cafe. It's still one of the, I think, the most popular things in our schools in East Boston. And so as it's expanding, and I understood if it's expanding in, uh, with the opportunity or with the equity lens, so going to some of the schools that have some of the bigger income inequality or concentrations of poverty, I think that's great. I'm just curious in terms of your timeline and rollout into other schools that may not have those uh, deeper needs, but still uh, the kids would love the quality of food at, that my, at my Way Cafe. I just appreciate the opportunity to, again, provide fresh food for our students in Boston. Um, so for this year, we did utilize uh, the, same op the same criteria for we, when we focused on East Boston, Roxbury, and Mattapan, which was the Opportunity Index, mm -hmm. Participation, and Free and Reduced Price Meal Eligibility, which is the, the, the list of schools that we're using for next year, which is Dorchester and South Boston. Okay. For the other schools, we are always, the, we did have a tentative rollout schedule for those schools. And we're looking at um, Jamaica Plain, Charlestown, Austin, Brighton, and Fenway in 2021, and Hyde Park, South End, West Roxbury, and Rosendale in 21-22. But in the meantime, as we, we're always exploring ideas within some of the limitations that we do have, uh, we've, I've been out to visit out in schools in, Ch in Charlestown to be able to see how we can add in um, um, salad bars in the high schools and right. in the high school and some of the areas where we can. We're also working with our partner, Revolution Foods. They have a program called Family Style Meals where they actually take them in within some of the limitations that we have in the facilities to be able to provide meals in uh, a whole, whole hotel pans and they can be able to serve the students. Mm -hmm. It's not quite exactly My Way Cafe, but it's definitely opportunities to getting children exposed to more choices that they have at that location. Uh, that's great, and, and uh, you didn't mention the North End. I didn't know if that was also going to, if that's a much later date, oh. but that's okay. Yes, I have to go back. I that's didn't fine. have it that's on the fine. list, but I'll definitely make no, sure to be on there. No, I appreciate that. Yes. I appreciate the rollout. Thank you. Um, and then following up on um, safety um, issues in school, so um, I wanted to make sure I followed up. Several of my constituents actually just wrote recently about the incident on East Boston and Excel Academy. A uh, woman walked in with a video camera, disgusted that we were celebrating Arab American uh, month, uh, was very, just, just had very, I would call very racist things to say about the, that community and just walked in and out around the, not around the school, but in the foyer area, videotaping that and noting the, looking at all the 
you know, some of the words in Arabic, noting that there were Congresswoman Talib was celebrated, all of these different things. And it was uh, how she got, she just rang the bell and walked in and was able to walk. And we did, I did speak with the principal um, and I believe the Boston Police Department have been notified. But just talk to, talk to me a little bit about more <laughs> safety protocols uh, and how that, I mean, she could have easily walked in with something else is my point. She just rang the bell and walked in. Sure, so relevant to Boston Public Schools, I appreciate that. I did watch the video yesterday. It got to our ombudsperson, um, which got to our safety team, um, which was then shared with Sergeant Section at the school police team. There are so many levels wrong with the video. Uh, it's hard to know where to start. Mm -hmm. But for me, around your question, um, it opened with talking about one of the priorities for our school year, which is school access. Um, that's completely opposite of the school access mandate that we have in Superintendent Circular SAF 12 for BPS. Um, so authorization um, and working with schools to support how they allow authorization into their space is one of our priorities for next year. So to give you an example of what that, how that circular plays out, in schools are in compliance with that. So no one is to be buzzed into a school until you've received identification and their reason for that. If their reason for being at that school is to see a staff person at that school, um, we have asked school staff to verify that prior to allowing that person into the space. If they have an appointment that's already been documented, they're allowed in, they sign in, they check their ID, and they're asked to wait in a designated location that multiple eyes have on that person just so that they're not wandering around the school. Albeit this can be challenging, that's given the location of main offices in some of our schools, right. hence the importance of knowing who you're letting in and why you're letting them before you allow them into your space. Mm -hmm. Because once they're in your space, and although you can't predict for everything, that's when you have the most issues. So myself and, and Rick Duraney and our safety team have been very clear with all school leaders that we will always take a phone call from the interim superintendent's office as to why someone wasn't welcome in a school. If they don't have a capacity to get someone into their school safely, we have told them not to allow that individual into their school, and we will follow up and figure out what the reason was. Their responsibilities are much larger than why, whatever reason that one person is at their door. Um, so I followed up um, personally with the school police unit on that issue yesterday. Um, there should have been an immediate threshold inquiry at Excel in East Boston as to why that individual was in their lobby, not in, in their lobby, but filming in their lobby, just having conversations with students, let alone the content that um, was discussed in the video. Um, I'm happy to provide the SAF 12 for you. It is a public document on the website, but I can provide that to the, to the full council. Thank you. Thank you. And we've been joined by Councillor Andrea Campbell. Uh, let me now recognize Councillor Matt O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good uh, morning, early afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for my tardiness. I had another commitment, but cut it short because this is one of the more important budget hearings. So I appreciate all of your work and to the folks behind me. Um, you may have already answered these questions or gone over it. I apologize. You can give me sort of the uh, Reader's Digest answers if that's the case, and I will review the tape. Um, but. I noticed that the uh, this year's budget as it relates to overall transportation is um, less than what FY19 ended up being, is that correct? Yes. And you're confident, I mean, we've, this happens a lot and this isn't an indictment on you guys, but transportation budget has been gone over it, I think every year since I've been on this body. So what makes it different for this year that you guys think? Um, I, well, one thing I think that's important to know is the, uh, the drop that you're seeing from FY19 to FY20 yeah. uh, projected um, is, it's, it, is a, it is a drop, right? I mean, you're, at, you're, you're absolutely accurate to call it a, a, a drop, but it's a relatively flat budget. Yeah. Uh, in previous budget, budget presentations, you would have seen a proposal for a bigger drop from the current year to the next year as the budget was being devised. Okay. And clearly that was not working well for us because of the rising costs contributing, um, uh, sorry, contributed by other factors beyond our control uh, were more than we could actually keep up, uh, keep up with. However, so, okay. for the year ahead, um, as Deliver mentioned earlier in our presentation, uh, we have had 
um, some very strong work in partnership with the Office of Special Education and the Office of Instructional Information Technology to be able to bring all of our resources to bear to take a much harder look at issues like the rising costs in door-to-door -door transportation, the rising costs in bus monitors. Uh, we actually just met yesterday as part of a, uh, a work group assembled to discuss those issues, and we believe that we are identifying many students across the district whose, um, whose disabilities would not normally require them to have those accommodations, and so we're working very closely with schools to be able to try to pull back on some of that, because we do believe that some of the growth there has been a little bit artificial, and again, I'm, I'm trying to speak delicately here because certainly so, students just, just who to, need the accommodations, sure. we want to be able to serve them. This is a good, this is a, it's good. I, I appreciate a more sort of conservative approach or perhaps liberal approach to costs and realizing that the, if there is a differential next year, it'll be less than what we've seen in years past. Correct. So you, that's great. Um, talk a little bit about the switch to alternative fuel. I'm very excited to see your efforts in that uh, space, John. Or, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll pass that to uh, Delavern if you wouldn't mind. Sure, of um, course. Delavern. Yeah. Um, so our fleet and compliance manager, Peter Crossan, who is in the audience, um, has done great, exceptional work, I should say, um, and we should recognize him for the work that he do. Right. Um, he's worked on making sure that our buses, that we're getting propane buses, so this next school year we're getting 75 additional uh, propane buses, which would mean 75 or percent of our fleet will be propane. Um, when you look at BPS and you look at nat things nat nationally, sorry, 90% of um, buses nationally still use diesel buses, and BPS, Boston Public Schools, will be at 50% propane. So Peter works um, yearly to transition our buses from diesel to propane, which is better for our environment. Terrific. Absolutely. You're speaking my language there, Delvern. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, any ideas to look at uh, electric buses in the future? I recognize the demand of the school buses. Uh, different than other cars, but there's also a lot of downtime in the middle of the day. So is, is there been any talk about having trying to pilot an electric uh, bus or electric routes? Uh, n no. So we we're, we're de we've n sorry, we've not looked at um, electric buses. Okay. And if further details is needed, we'll probably have Peter come down and speak. The, to quite a, a, it's fine. I, I, there's I more I want to get yeah. to. I, I, I guess this would allow this to be my request that in the future as we talk about things, I know other districts have employed electric buses for school transportation. I recognize, again, that a school bus is on a road uh, and can have less of a battery life than perhaps other municipal vehicles, Correct. but there's also an opportunity for recharging, the supercharging stations. The, the technology is advancing in such a way that char fully charging a battery on an electric vehicle will soon be not dissimilar from filling up your gas tank in terms of getting it done in a matter of minutes. So uh, I hope in the future we can be talking about uh, electric fleets, but nevertheless appreciate this important step to diesel. Okay. Um, the central office has seen an increase of, I think, half a million dollars or so for these things. Is that correct? Or, I'm sorry, how, yeah, half a million. This is po this page is five central in the PowerPoint office. central office. Yes, uh, Delvern presented on that uh, yeah, earlier, Councillor, and um, the, the brief uh, story there is um, that's happening for two reasons, uh, and both are, uh, I think, somewhat misleading. Um, okay. The number, I should say, is somewhat misleading. Number one, there were some key vacancies in the Transportation Department this past year, and because those positions were not filled, those expenses were not incurred. Those positions are now going to be filled for FY20. What are thus, those positions? You're looking at one of them going into <laughs> FY, uh, FY19, so um, we're, we're extremely fortunate to have Delvern in the position of a director. Um, you've likely seen over the last few years that that has been uh, a source of turnover for us. And very, very early on in FY19, the director of transportation resigned, and that position was then vacant for a short period of time. Delavern stepped in and did a fantastic job as our interim director, and then was promoted to director of transportation uh, in the winter right. time. Um, there were other positions, including assistant director of operations that were vacant for a short period of time, assistant director of school supports and customer service uh, that is still vacant and has been vacant uh, since Delavern left that post and moved into the director's job. Um, those positions are you know, vital to the organization's well-being, and we're very happy to say that they all will be filled um, really by the end, the end of 
what next week or something. Yes, correct. Um, so and, and there's uh, that's one reason, right? Those vacancies, right? There are others that I didn't. How talk How long to, have they been vacant? The, um, the two, the two the, positions. The, that you the say? Um, director position was was vacant for a, a few months. Yeah. The assistant director of operations position was was vacant for a few months. The assistant director of school supports and customer services has been vacant for, uh, I guess, about eight months or so. Um, in addition to that, though, it's, it's really important to know that there are two two causes to this increase that you're seeing, and again, it is somewhat artificial. The other is, as you know, BPS does their um, personnel budgeting based on average salaries, and average salaries fluctuate year to year. And what time, what oftentimes happens is it leads to what seems to be big swings on paper, when in reality it's not big swings. People are still getting paid what they were paid, if not with the step increase attached to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's no like massive raises given out across the department. There are no new positions planned for FY20 that weren't planned for FY19. Uh, and so again, you're not seeing a, a real increase per se. It's more of an increase in the way it's accounted for. Okay, and just briefly, what percentage of the entire school budget goes to all central office positions? All central office across the school district? Yeah. I, I don't know, but we'll get that for you by the end of the year. I think it's here. about 5%. Does that sound right? Dave, does that sound about right? 5%, yes. Okay. So, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Campbell. Um, thank you, Councilor Ciomo, and uh, thank you to the panelists uh, for all that you do um, for BPS, our students, and our families. Um, and I've seen some of you guys, obviously, on the ground in the schools, um, including you, Laura, with the My Way Cafe rollout, um, and Kim, of course, your involvement with our public safety meeting. So thank you, uh, Deliver, and as well, and John, and Deliver, and lives in my district, so a lot of love to Deliver. And um, I just, um, I can review the tape. I apologize for being late, um, so I won't ask the same questions that were already asked. I just have some questions on the welcome centers, and maybe this is best for you, John. Um, just the number of welcome centers, our investments in the in, in welcome centers, um, how many employees or staff do we have operating in the welcome centers? I or maybe you're not the right person. <laughs> Are you seeing that in my face? Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can tell you that we have four welcome centers. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you roughly where they are, and that's pretty much all I can tell you. Okay. Um, uh, Monica Roberts, our chief engagement officer, okay. uh, oversees the welcome centers as part of our overall engagement efforts. I'll connect with Monica on those things. Sorry about that. No, no, that's all I have. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, Councilor Sumo. Sabi, uh, Councilor Sabi George. <laughs> Who was I? Um, Thank you. I know that Councilor Edwards asked a little bit about the incident at the Excel High School, but that's the charter school, right? Correct. And are we directly involved in the in any of their safety protocols? No, but that did get to me yesterday through our ombudsperson, um, our safety team, and I spoke to Sergeant Sexton about it. So anytime something that will come across our way, we will ensure that it gets to the appropriate authorities so that they can support them, and we will also offer support should they need it. Great, and we'll also lear learn from it, see if there's any sort of lessons learned from, Correct. from that incident. Mm -hmm. um, and I just saw sort of the headlines of it, and I know that Councilor Edwards asked about it, so just reiterate that. Um, so I want to switch my questions to the food services, if that's okay, Laura. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your work. Um, on behalf of our kids, and, and we know that so many of our students um, living at or below the poverty level in their reliance on our food and nutrition services is, is critical. Can we talk a little bit about breakfast? I think we talked about it last year. There's been a lot of move, movement up at the state about kids eating breakfast. Um, what do, and, and the movement to breakfast after the bell. Can we talk a little bit about how we're delivering breakfast after the bell? What does that look like in our schools? Sure. So um, in January of this year, 2019, we did receive a clarification and a mandate from the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that any school that is considered over 60% free and reduced priced would be required to offer a breakfast after the bell. So Boston is a community eligibility provision school district, so all of our schools are fall under that, regardless of even if we look at individual status, some schools are higher than the, 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 the citywide 70% free and reduced, and some are lower than that. But everyone, because we all, we, we are a universal feeding program, so we wanted to make sure we were in compliance with that. On March 14th, I had the opportunity to present a professional development to all of our administration to talk to them about opportunities because the, the notification from DESE also stated that by 
April 1st. If a school did not have an after, after the bell program, they would have to implement one by May 31st of this school year. So part of that, the language is very, the, the language states that the, the uh, breakfast must be offered after the first tardy bell. So that could, it could be a, di a different variety of different things. In Boston, we have four uh, main models that we provide breakfast after the bell. One is breakfast in the classroom. Second is a grab and go from the cafeteria to the classroom. Uh, third is a grab and go in a different area outside of the classroom. And the fourth is keeping the cafeteria open after the, the bell has rung. Through all of these different models that we offer breakfast for our students, we are, we are, we are focused through the mandate that came. We're focused on about 30 schools that only offer cafeteria service or that do not have a breakfast after the bell to be able to help them make sure that they're meeting the mandate. And with that, we, when we presented, we had about 24, 26 schools submit information that this is what they're, they wanted more opportunities to be able to determine how they can be in their location, be able to increase breakfast after the bell. So what's our current percentage of students who are getting breakfast at any point, whether it's before or after the bell? Current, altogether, it's uh, about 39, excuse me, 41%. It's 41%. And how do we increase that number? So the, the goal for by increasing is we have to create access to the meals. And I think part of it is so, also- So what school, how many schools and what are the schools doing that have a much higher percent than 41%? So the schools that do breakfast in the classroom, so we have less than 20 that do that, mm -hmm. it's anywhere between 80 and 90% participation. So if we're seeing 80 to 90% participation, which increases the opportunity for reimbursement, right? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we doing more of that breakfast in the classroom? And as a former classroom teacher, I get some of the hesitation around food in the classroom and the mess and sometimes the distraction, but I also appreciate the benefit of making sure that our kids have access to breakfast. Well, I think for, for us, breakfast in the classroom definitely does increase the access, but it doesn't necessarily, because the way the pro program does work, does it, it doesn't uh, not always necessarily answer that the child is actually eating the breakfast, mm -hmm. it's just that we're counting breakfast. What I, what some of the things that I like and I focus on are where we can include our accountability, so when we are audited, that we can be able to say to the state, we know this child took this breakfast and is eating it. Uh, but so some of the programs that we are seeing success on when they have a cafeteria to the classroom, meaning so they'll bring the students down, they grab something from the cafeteria, and they go right back up into the classroom. And children who really want to participate will be able to. And we also do encourage them that it, maybe they might not be hungry, but they could be hungry in an hour, an hour and a half. So we also provide items that they could save for, for safer later. Right. So those are some of the uh, schools that we do see success. Other schools where we all see success that are even it's cafeteria service, it's because the administration has made it a point that this is something that's a very, it's vital to the the school, we want to make sure we're creating this culture of food in the school. And so we are seeing a higher, not as high as 80, 90 percent, but in between the ranges of 60 and, and 70 percent participation. The, um, the, is, is there a way to incentivize a school to increase those numbers and get more kids the access? And the, the other piece of that, though, with the, cap, the role of the cafeteria, is when we have kids that are late to school, because we know that we have a problem with tardiness, for example. Mm -hmm that cafeteria is really not the answer, that the classroom because becomes the answer because we want kids in class for their academic work right. so that the food in the classroom or the cart just outside the classroom. So we are currently working on those different kinds of pilots because we, we recognize that even through the feedback that we receive from administration, sometimes it's logistics and issues in the schools that may be uh, problematic as well as even for us in food services. I may not have enough staff in the morning mm -hmm. to be able to have different carts, but we're looking at those options specifically exactly what you said is creating carts in areas, in hallways, in areas that can be much more self-sustainable. We're looking at working with partnerships through the EOS Foundation and looking at how Spring Field does their, pro their processes, how Salem does their processes, and as well as uh, um, Chicopee, because they are seeing a lot of success, and it's not necessarily breakfast in the classroom. Right. I'm actually going to Springfield in a few weeks. That's why I wanted yes. to make sure I asked these questions. Thank uh, you. Absolutely. I'll ask the rest next round. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Councillor Jane. Thank you so much. Um, staying on the topic of good food for our, our young people, uh, thank you for the work that you do. I'm very... Um, Excited about My Way Cafe. I think it's definitely the right way to go in terms of making sure our young people have fresh, local, uh, healthy food. So you're in 29 schools? 29 schools as yes. of today. 
Uh, and the, the plan for expansion, I know um, Councilor Edwards is asking, how many, is, is the goal to get into all of our schools? Absolutely. Yeah, So the, uh, the, the mayor just released the, the list of the schools, so we are on April 24th, so we are going into the Dorchester and the South Boston areas next school year. And then we have developed a tentative rollout plan for all of the neighborhoods between now and 2022 to be able to encompass all of the schools. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Uh, 2022 and um, on slide 12 so if we look at slide 12 and and access to good healthy food is so important and very much connected to whether or not our, our children are showing up ready to learn um, uh, it seems that many students are enjoying school lunch it's in the middle of the day they're there um, the, the decline not the decline but the low numbers for school breakfast is that about tardiness? Is that young people are eating breakfast at home? Um, what do you make of these low numbers compared to the lunch numbers, the breakfast compared to the lunch? So definitely access is always key. We do have a very captive audience in lunch. Particularly, you see higher participations in lunch for elementary students because they're all brought down to the cafeteria. It's very, it's very scheduled and children are you know, creatures of habit. In high schools and middle schools, it's, it's a tougher arena because even their schedules are different. And I think anecdotally, it is a lot of different pieces of information of why children aren't participating in breakfast. It could be, you know, they're late on the bus. It could be in areas that, you know, they're, they're, they eat at home or it could be that they don't have access. And, some, and in some cases, maybe we in food services aren't doing enough to make sure that they understand that the cafeteria is always open. So when we looked at all of the data and when we were presenting information to administration, we wanted to make sure that they were aware and know their data school by school to say your free and reduced price eligibility is 70 just to say for example 70 percent but your participation is 17 percent so how can we help you close that gap what is it that we we can do in food services to be make, making sure that we're able to help you reach and obtain that that your every student who does want to eat happens to eat. And it could even be just a shift in the culture of the school of how food is maybe not necessarily a concern that it, you know, creates pests or rodents or anything like that. But when we had the opportunity to speak with administration, we had I had other principals and headmasters speak and say what they did in their schools to be able to make that change. To be able to think through, well, what would be, what, how can we create more access points for, for students? Because that's the most important thing. And have you seen any models uh, in terms of schools that are, are increasing their numbers, in terms of breakfast in particular. So, you know, I'm concerned that this is the first meal of the day. We all know how important breakfast uh, is for all of us, but particularly our young people. If we're looking at uh, fiscal year 16, we're at, we have um, 39, or well, 3.9. Um, we see a dip in fiscal 17, another dip in 18, it goes back up in 19, which right. is good. How do we continue to get that number to, to grow? I think certainly the awareness, is, and it's also, it is literally a case-by-case, school-by-school review and observation. I'm a, happy to say that since we, since the mandate came out in January from DESE, we had nine schools that immediately made some changes in offering breakfast after the bell, breakfast uh, grab-and-go carts, and we saw, and out of those nine schools, five of them were high schools, so they do recognize their need, and we saw an increase of participation anywhere between three and 30 percent participation increase. Then, uh, then we also have another um, 10 schools that signed up to make sure that they met the mandate need by May 31st. So I think that as we are as we closing the end of the school year, we're able to see. I know I see it. There's a definite vast difference between participation in October than in March and in April. We are seeing some increases, not as much as we want to, but it is our focus for us for next year. That again, I always share that anytime someone will give us access and opportunity to provide meals to students, we will do it. Yep. And Thank Councilor, you. Yep. Sorry, um, if I may, just a, a couple other uh, things, and I want to come back to Councillor Edwards' question before as well. The, the north end is going to be joined with the south end in the 21-22 rollout. I just want to make sure that we respond to, to the Councillor's question earlier. Um, as far as breakfast participation, just two other factors that I'd point out. Number one, we still have a large number, I think more than a third of our elementary schools that start at 9.30. Um, schools that start that late, typically we see a very low participation rate in breakfast because many of those children have already eaten breakfast before they arrive at 
the school. Um, secondly, as Laura mentioned, what we are tackling head on is the model that each school chooses to operate under and we're trying to work with those schools to implement grab and go carts, to think about breakfast in the classroom, to explore other options to provide breakfast for students. Yeah. And, and just on the, I have just to follow up to what you said, we know for sure that young people are eating at home when you say that they've eaten breakfast at home? It's only anecdotal. Oh, okay. Right. Um, so thank you. I just want to thank you for the work. I'm excited about My Way Cafe. I think really important to get the breakfast numbers up and increase access. Um, just so important in terms of being ready to learn and closing opportunity and achievement gaps. Um, my final question, thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me. I had a question at our last hearing and I think I got the data here about the number of students that uh, were grandfathered under the three zone system that are still being transported through the home base system. Mm -hmm. um, and I have here for fiscal year 19, there were two students. Is that, that doesn't sound right to me in this. How many students are under the old assignment plan that are being transported currently? I believe what that data might, might be referring to, and I apologize, I can't speak to it completely. Yeah. And, and Del, I don't know if you have um, that data, but that might be, there might be only two students themselves who are still grandfathered under that system. Um, but as you know, they're the siblings of students who uh, were in under the previous zones, uh, those siblings are still grandfathered as well. That number surely does not respond exactly. to that. So we can try to track that, that down. Would be helpful. I don't know if you have anything more no. on that. Thank okay. you. Thank you so right. much. Thank that you. would be helpful. Thank, Thank you, Council Baker. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, John, a quick B, uh, Bill BPS question is <clears throat> when we're all done with the build out on BPS, is that going to help us with our transportation budget as far as more walkers to school? It's hard to say whether it would help us on more walkers to school. What I would say though is um, that probably it would in that um, a couple of our priority areas right now as far as uh, new builds and expansions are concerned are East Boston, Dorchester, Mattapan, Roxbury. Um, the reason why is because typically in those areas we have more students than we have seats. And because we have more students than we have seats, for example, there are a large number of students who live in the population uh, center of Dorchester, Mattapan who are going far outside of their neighborhoods to attend school. In some cases that's by choice, in other cases that's because there are no seats nearby. So we know that we have to take an active look within Bill BPS at growing schools in those areas so that students no longer have to travel so far to school, uh, at least by and large. Now that's a long-term goal and that mm -hmm. will take some time through building design, community engagement, building construction, so on and so forth. But I, I do think your, your question is, is fair because I, I believe it will likely increase that, um, but it's hard to say because the goal of Build BPS isn't necessarily to increase the number of students who are walking to school. Uh, one of the goals is to increase the number of seats that are available in neighborhoods that currently have excess demand compared to the capacity in their neighborhoods. And is, are we building anything in those areas, uh, is there anything slated to be built in those, like in the concentrations wherever they are, is there anything in the pipeline to be built now? There's nothing concrete in the pipeline right now, um, but we are actively looking at that, knowing mm -hmm. that that is one of the priorities out of the gate uh, for Build Build PS. Um, so no, not right now. Yeah, and, and what is the percentage of, of walkers or kids that get themselves to school every day in the in the whole system. Do we have do we have that number? We'll look that up, Councillor. We might be able to get that to you by the end of the hearing. Yep, that's okay. Thank you. Um, John, will you talk about the Campbell Resource Center a little bit? A couple of years ago they kind of switched the way they did that operation. That was used as a as a sort of distribution center and, and we we changed, I think this predates you, mm -hmm. um, we changed the way we, we did business. So instead of having the distribution center, we were relying on the companies to deliver directly to the schools. Have we seen any, or have we seen any, um, any positive, positive savings from, from that, that you know of? 
It does predate me, Councillor, so I, I apologize. I won't be able to give you an answer on the savings. I mm -hmm. do know that there have been positives to that. Uh, if not on savings, which might very well be there, mm -hmm. certainly on the uh, the level of service, the fact that schools are now getting their ships, uh, their shipments directly to them, mm -hmm. uh, that is absolutely not a knock on our facilities team, who previously were distributing mm -hmm. the materials to our schools, but it it does mean that the process is just that much faster. Yeah, and, and if and this would be something for for maybe your team to look into. What happened with all those people that were there? I, I think some of them got laid off going back. Were they ever were they ever brought back? And, and I, I don't need that answer now. Just to get a sense of what happened to the people that were in that that were in the Campbell Resource and staying on the Campbell Resource. Um, how much of that building is 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 being utilized right now? Is there a plan to maybe take operations out of there or with the Glover's Court? I'm, I'm bringing, you know, a different side of my job in, into this this discussion. So, is there any talk on uh, on Campbell Resource that you're really able to elaborate on? What I can tell you is, um, as we have with other city departments, we have a very strong relationship with the Boston Planning and Development Agency, mm -hmm. and they brought. Um, these sort of initial plans, so to speak, for Glover's Corner to us over a year ago, uh, knowing that the Campbell Resource Center is a Boston Public Schools property. Um, we also made it very, very clear that the bus yard located just just next to that, just southeast of that, um, is also a, a critically important asset within Boston Public Schools, albeit one that we lease. So we're continuing to work in lockstep with the BPDA as they sort of build the neighborhood plans around those sites. Uh, to my knowledge right now, uh, there is no plans per se that would disrupt the Campbell Resource Center yeah. uh, that will stay as a, a hub for operations as well as the Dorchester Welcome Center, um, but we're going to continue to monitor that closely with the BPDA. Okay, so we'll wait, we'll wait and see on that. Can we talk about the um, the MBTA passes? What do we spend on the MBTA passes, and and um, what is the MBTA's contribution? It's difficult to say what the MBTA's contribution yeah. is. What I can tell you is that um, a, a student not affiliated at all with any of our obligations under Boston Public Schools could purchase an M7 student pass yeah. for thirty dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Um, over the last few years, the MBTA has charged us $29 a month, so giving us a discount on that. The total cost for the school district this year is about $5.7 million for roughly 20,000 T passes for students in 7 through 12 who are eligible for those. What we were able to do with the MBTA is knowing that we were facing a fair increase from the MBTA, we had begun to budget for $6.2 million for the roughly 20,000 T-passes that we again expected to have in the 1920 school year. Um, but we seized the opportunity both through changing leadership at MBTA as well as the groundswell of support that we've had built around this issue over the last couple of years and quite frankly some some persistent conversations that I personally have been involved in with the MBTA, we were able to negotiate with them a, a better rate through collaboration with the mayor's office as well as MBTA leadership for a flat rate going forward of $6.7 million. So we're no longer paying a per pass mm -hmm. price of $29 or $31 or whatever. It's just 6.7 across the board. That then will cover us for roughly 30,000 passes or however many we need to serve the needs of the 7th through 12th students across BPS but also charter and private schools due to our state law obligations there. So, so charter and private schools within Boston, what about going the other way, kids that live in Boston and, 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 may, not, and, and may go to school in Newton or, or Belmont? Or then they wouldn't be eligible. For they're that. not eligible, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilor O'Malley. Okay, I'm going to follow up on Councilor Baker's line of questioning and, and I will start by saying uh, tremendously grateful for the mayor's leadership and all of you on this. The, the idea of having free M7 passes for all students is, uh, is remarkable. And, and just to be clear, that's just for the school year, September through June, right? Or is it for the calendar year? I apologize. That's okay, John. No, no, not at all. I was uh, giving you a compliment. See, you don't listen. I'm thanking you for your great work on the M7s. Oh. Um, is, that, is that September through June? Yes, it's two okay. months. Yes. Is there, do we offer a discounted pass for youth in the summertime, or can we? Or can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, so in the summertime, um, students can, their same M7 passes that they use during the school year, it turns into a reduced price, so half price. So okay. they 
and they can use their half price um, cards throughout the summertime. That's great. Um, until they get their newly assigned passes the following school year. So it'll be half price across the board, be it commuter rail or bus? Yep, and commuter rail in zone one and zone two. Zone one, zone two. Yes. Not 1A. That, I, that's, yeah. that's a fight I'm having with the T about how they treat West Roxbury, Roslindale, and Hyde Park as another, and really another right. municipality, so we'll talk later. And, and then, Councilor, I, I apologize yep. to interrupt. Um, uh, Dell has the answer for Councilor Baker's question on the number of walkers. Yes, um, sorry. So we have 20,535 students that either walk or is driven to school by parents or use other modes of transportation. 20,535, you yes. said? Okay, so it's not a, not a majority, but close to it. Yes. They're a little less than that, I guess. No, yeah. Um, okay, and you can help me with a constituent service question. I have a constituent whose parent works for the town of Brookline, and therefore they get to go to Brookline schools. They're in high school. Will they have access to an M7 or no? No, I actually spoke to Bob in your office. Unfortunately, unfortunately no. Okay. So it would just be, f so, so Medco students similarly wouldn't have the, so, so you have to go to school within the city of Boston to get it. Yes. yes. Interesting, okay. Um, I'm looking at slide, or page 20 of your uh, volume of service where it shows the decrease in BPS um, from students transported by school type, uh, FY15 to FY19, 25,000 to 18,000. I assume that decrease, um, a, a small part of it is the decline in student population, but probably the larger issue is no longer offering bus service to seventh and eighth graders. Is that correct? That is correct. So okay. no longer offering bus services to um, students in seventh yep. and eighth grade. And then the charter growth, on the other hand, is that just an increase in the number of charter schools that exist now as opposed to those that existed in FY15? Or is that the student population has grown in charter schools? Um, I think. There has been an additional amount of charter schools that has opened since the FY15. 15. 15. Okay. In addition to that, there are some schools that were open at that time but weren't fully grown up, as I we see. as we say. Like yeah. they might be, you know, all the way through 12th grade, but at that point was only, were only through eighth grade, something along those lines. Yeah. Okay, that's great. And then, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the the um, on page 22 now, it shows the per pupil spending. Mm -hmm. So there's one student who is a door-to-door -door private parochial to the cost of about 13000 uh, which is what he or she is or what we're paying for that student because it's only one, whereas the private special ed door-to-door -door is 202 students and it's significantly more. It's more than double that. I know that's the average and I know some students obviously uh, require a lot uh, more expensive services, but can you talk a little bit about why there's the def differential there? The major reason for that is the private special education door-to-door -door largely transported outside of the city. And as a result of that, we're no longer able to reuse those buses as we would for students who stay within the city. Oh, so it's likely that the private parochial door-to-door -door is in the city confines and then the transportation mode is reused. Okay, that makes right. sense. Um, and then again, efforts to sort of, there, there's obviously a big difference between door-to-door um, -door. Uh, price per average price per pupil and corner pickup, and I know that we've heard from many folks, many parents whose children are being picked up door to door, who actually would benefit or would opt into if they were able to do so on a uh, sort of corner pickup. Can you talk about how I know you've been working on this, John and, and uh, Delvar, on efforts you've made to sort of increase that as a more commonplace way to pick up students? Um, so, a part of the special ed process um, now, when students are going through the IEP evaluation, there's an additional piece of accommodated corner yep. um, that is brought up in that meeting where students are being assigned to accommodated corner. So um, there are different options, not only door to door, uh, students can be assigned to accommodated corners. And I would venture a guess that many, not all, but many parents would welcome that as, you know, as an alumnus of Boston Public Schools, waiting at the bus stop with friends was a great sort of social aspect of the school day. So I, th I think that this is a really good step you guys are doing and encourage you to continue to grow that, uh, the accommodated corner pickup as opposed to door to door. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Councilor you. Asavi George. Thank you, um, Chair. So I just want to continue a few of my questions from uh, the food service piece. We talk, I know that we're running, sorry, Laura, I know that we're running a deficit um, and where this is a budget hearing. I, I want to understand what are the moves that we can make 
to recapture some of those lost funds? Is it all based on some of the federal reimbursement? Effort? Yeah, a lot of it. So every meal we we serve is every meal that we're able to it, that we claim that we can be able to submit to the to the government to be able to get a reimbursement back. So, but that doesn't in, does not include meals that we may have served or, pre or prepared, which you know we use labor for all that, and then food that we provide that that it goes to a waste. So we are we focus on a lot of the operational and logistics to be able to make sure that we can capture that every meal that we're serving that we're paying for is reflective of how we can be able. Uh, it was reflective in the budget. So when we, as I say, when we realized that we were, we are, our participation wasn't where we needed it to be, we, we focus on the things that we can be able to, to curtail. Um, inventory controls, you know, menu changes, purchasing, and then all because our, our, our opportunities to limit labor are very, they're very, it's slim to none. Because what we have set for the year is basically about however in our contract for, with our, with our AFSCME team, we do have meals per labor hour, which we're looking to implement for next year. And we can do it twice a year. So those are the things that we look at and we focus to making sure that we can be able to capture that. For our budget for FY20, we're looking at a lot of different things. We are taking into consideration uh, increases in My Way Cafe and meals served. We are also looking at, as we're focusing on after the, after the Bell programs, how we can increase participation, but also some of the things that we really truly focus on are our cost of food, to making sure that we can be still be able to have, again, high quality that meet our standard uh, meals, but then also that we, the, that minimize the impact of the budget. We are also looking, and we do have a great partner with the Shaw Family Foundation that's helping us be able to cover some you know, costs that we're looking at as we're transforming, but still we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can that we are focusing on it. But in, even in an urban city uh, district, in a, the setting that we have, the reimbursement that we receive is the same across the, across the country. So even our cost of living is clearly higher, but our reimbursement doesn't change the same. So we, have to, we try to do a lot with the little that we do get. Are other districts seeing the same challenges with, especially in this region, if we think about the cost of, of doing this business? Are we seeing similar trends with the, the lack of um, meals being served or eaten or I do see it. We are, as uh, Boston is part of the Urban School Food Alliance, so we do work with uh, about eight other uh, large school districts, including Philadelphia, um, Dallas, Los Angeles, New York, Miami, and when we are seeing those, they see those same challenges as well. When I was in Los Angeles, we did have a very, very big deficit, but a part of that is because of the, the labor costs that we did have and not enough meals were coming through. So part of it, as we look, we do everything we can to create access for our programs, because the goal is that the, the more meals you serve, the, more, the bigger your budget gets. But there are a lot of variables that do prevent us from being able to, to be able to be as um, successful as we want to be, to be. When you have 20 minutes tip for children to eat, right. or if, you're, if there isn't necessarily a, a big culture of, of having breakfast after the bell, those kinds of things. So those are the things that we're trying to take bites of to making sure that we're helping them, sh uh, helping the administration shift, that we want to work together as partners because we know what we do together, we will be able to benefit a child. I think identifying the 20 minutes too is a, is a real problem. I know my own boys don't typically get lunch because they don't they want to spend the time chit-chatting with their friends and not just waiting in line right. for food that they're not going to have time to eat. Right. I think that's a, that's a real challenge across the district, as well as the timing of lunch across the district. Correct. The number of our schools, because of some scheduling constraints, have lunches at not ideal, at not ideal right. times. So right. I think it, that all plays a role. Um, w with the, the cost of lunch, um, what's the relationship with the vendor, Revolution Foods, and renegotiating that contract? Where are we in our contract with them, and is there an opportunity to negotiate better numbers? So we, ha we went through an RFP process, and our contract is set for three years. We are in the end, tail end of the second year, and next year is our third year. And I think that after, we, based off of the rollout for the My Way Cafes and where we are at, we have opportunity, we would probably, we won't capture all of all of the satellite schools that are going into a conversion. So we may have to go into another RFP. And it's an opportunity for anyone to go in and be able to say they can provide us a high quality, clean label product to be able to serve to children in the, in the interim as we, as we switch over into a buy Boston for Boston product uh, uh, program. I think for, for us to be able to renegotiate, it's very, 
very limiting and probably non-existent, I would say, but I can say with the new process that we're looking at with family-style meals that we actually launched at the, at the Blackstone Elementary, that cost per meal is actually about, it's seven cents lower than what we're currently paying. So we're looking at those options to be able to increase. Right. The chair told me to keep going. Um, <laughs> If you with, want to. Thank you. With the, with the My Way Cafe, this came up in a, an earlier hearing, and I just wanted to understand the difference between what we're spending as a district and what's being, what's being contributed by foundation money. Okay. So the My Way Cafe, um, the program in itself is an operation run by food services and covered by food services costs. Mm -hmm. The foundation has contributed the equipment in the, in the schools and has also contributed funding for a trainer and a, a director to run the program. And if there are opportunities of small wares, things like that here and there that they, be, they have the opportunity to be able to help us with, they, they do. They are very, uh, very generous in opportunities to make sure that if there's transformational costs that they'd be willing to cover. But we, we also want to make sure as a department that we don't want to be able to take on more you know, transformational costs that we can't afford because we can't expect that the foundation's gonna be able to sustain these processes for us. Okay. So, but they are, they are, they're willing to work with us and help us with what we need. And they do have, they have put a lot of manpower in from their perspective to help us analyze data and to look at information to help us make better decisions on how the My Way Cafe is rolling out. And then one of the topics of an, of an earlier budget hearing was the, the, how we measure attendance and student achievement and all that. Have we ever looked at attendance um, and related it at all to food services? Not, not here. I, when I was in Los Angeles, that was one of the key things we did as we looked at, as we were rolling out breakfast in the classroom, that we could see s um, slight changes when, we, when the school went from a regular breakfast program into a, in the classroom, that we had, saw increases in attendance. But I haven't been able to explore that. I'm more than happy to be able to talk to OIT and some of the other people, see how we can be able to uh, maybe get some, some information together. Yeah, so, I mean, if we see a positive correlation between the two and, and maybe in Los Angeles, if there was a direct relationship between the two right. data points, that would be something worth looking at. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to uh, transportation. I just have a few questions again, because we, we had a longer and more thorough hearing um, a few months ago. And I think one of my colleagues asked a little bit about Safe Routes to School already. Um, can we just, can you just give me some very quick overview on Safe Routes to School, where we, where we are with it as a program and any support we need to be advocating for on it. While Dell's looking at her notes, I'll tell you that yesterday was one of our um, walk to school days uh, here in Boston. So we have a number of schools that participate in the Safe Routes to Schools program, um, albeit it's a, it's a minority of schools. Uh, we're still looking to grow that on a yearly basis. Uh, and I believe Dell could probably speak to that in a little bit more detail as well as the grant that we're trying to um, uh, acquire. Right. Um, so right now, Peter again, the work that Peter have been, um, has been doing, so uh, right now we're still in the running for a $1 million Safe Routes to School grant um, through MassDOT. And what will uh, that fund, the million dollar grant? Peter, do you, do you mind? come down? Come on yeah. down, Peter. And while Peter's coming down, he may also uh, be able to answer some of these questions, or you can. Um, what's the connection between uh, MBTA and Better Bus Routes in your work in the Transportation Department? Is there any sort of relationship or direct line of communication, and then the direct, uh, the dedicated bus lanes that we, we have piloted and moved towards as a city and look continuing to look to grow. Are you involved in at all in that? Because it does help our transportation department. Is that all, Peter? Yeah, so we're, we're most definitely involved, and that would, um, we should segue to Peter. Let me uh, address the, good afternoon. Let me address the uh, MBTA piece. The Better Bus Route Program um, does not include the S bus service that the T operates on school days. <clears throat> on school days, they operate about 200 additional buses that increase capacity to accommodate the students um, run school days only. So those are not impacted by the better bus routes. 
Um, we are working with the MBTA, BTD, BPDA, and the new BTD transit team on bus lanes. Uh, we have one opening in June and another one in the fall and a, and a few that we're working on now studying in terms of volume and the impact it would have positively for our service. With Safe Routes to School, that's a combined effort. <clears throat> with B BPDA took the lead on the grant writing. With BTD, BPS, and BPS, DOT, to identify specific areas where we could um, install a, a number of different types of traffic calming uh, devices, uh, uh, make improvements to crosswalks, uh, bump out corners, and general traffic calming. And the grant focused on the, tr the corridor that went from Seaver or Columbus at Walnut down past the David Ellis School as far as the Trotter, where we have densely, dense neighborhoods with a number of kids walk. And as Waze has become more popular as an app for out-of-towners, um, those streets have seen a lot more traffic than they had in the past. Right. And then on the, I just want to clarify, on the better bus routes, I'm sorry, on the dedicated bus lanes, we're looking at that from a school bus perspective too, where we can run our school buses. That, that's correct. It, it, we're, we're delighted to have a unique situation where the bus lanes are shared between the MBTA and BPS. And we will have a uh, bus lane is opening in Brighton shortly um, from about where the Jackson Mann School is as far as Package Corner. That's not, we do not have a lot of buses that travel in that direction at that time right now, but when the Mass Pike work commences, uh, that'll be an important part of making, uh, delivering on time service. Um, as part of the North Washington Street Bridge Project, um, as we transition to the temporary structure in the fall, there will be a bus lane inbound from Causeway Street to Haymarket for BPS and MBTA buses. And there are a couple of others that we're looking at uh, volume and number of buses uh, throughout the city. So I, it's a thing to come. It saves two or three minutes to five minutes, but it also increases traffic, the flow of regular traffic, and it isolates students and buses from general traffic. And for the T passengers, they're also isolated from general traffic on the curb. Great. Well, I think we find so many of our kids are usually two or five, three minutes late for school. So the sooner we can get them there, the better. It's great. Right. And we found that we really coexist with the T mm -hmm. uh, extraordinarily well. We tend to stomp at the same corners. Um, and so there's been no conflict there. Thank you. That's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Chair, if you wouldn't mind, um, yeah, as sure. Councilor Sabi George has concluded her questions, I wanted to come back to one from earlier. The cost for Crisis Go, Councilor, is $72,000 a year. Oh, thank you for remembering mm -hmm. that. I had already moved on in my mind. <laughs> it's $72,000. $72,000 a year. And that gets us, um, I'm sorry, Chair, That's if you don't right. mind. That is communication between central office and schools. And yes. we're looking at the opportunity to have that internally in schools mm -hmm. and then potentially someday maybe from schools out. Yes. But the 72 pays inside school and school to district. Mm -hmm. right now. And all the technical assistance that goes along with that. Right. Thank you. Yep. Great. Um, I just wanted to uh, look at uh, the slide 11, Laura. Um, are those actuals FY17 and 18? So it was very little deficit or actually surplus, right? In it was, it's actuals based off of once we receive more assistance from the, from the district. Great. So I can go back and give you the information of what right. we ended up the year. So that, right. but it, it was, they, we provided assistance and so it, it's, it's definitely bigger than that. The and no surplus. No, no surplus. surplus, right. It was something that John had asked me about right. yesterday when we were reviewing. He said we, we probably should, and I, it was my fault, so I right. apologize. No, that's okay. And, and, you know, I'm just thinking back, you know, historically, food services has always run a deficit, and a pretty substantial one at that. And, uh, but, I, you know, I, I'm really encouraged by all the great work with um, the Fresh Food Initiative, the My Way Cafe Initiative. I can't wait for it to come to my district in 
2021. 2021. 2021. That's, that's right. correct. We will be there next year with the Public Facilities Department beginning the design process. So right. uh, schools out there will start to see some of the progress for that a year before right. the, the sites are actually ready to serve. Right. And, and just w one last thing I'm, you know, looking at um, the decline. Well, so these revenue numbers aren't really actual on this for sheet right now for FY17, 18, 19, let's say. Well, 19, probably not. If we're not through 19 yet. But 17 and 18, the revenue, um, which is in the form of reimbursement, I would imagine. So for 17 and 18, yeah, it's the reimbursement, and then also it includes an uh, assistance we received from the from the the district in reference to the contract for uh, for Revolution Foods. So okay. it would be um, the the revenue would be probably about 34 million dollars. Okay, all right. Well, I just want to thank you all for the important, great work you do. Uh, you too, John. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. <laughs> thank we you. We wanted all to about feature the, the ladies today. So thank you all very much for your great testimony today. And um, as pertaining to uh, BPS operations, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.